Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, consider subscribing. Also, drop a like on this video before we get started. I am your channel host, let's begin. I've always been afraid of my past coming to get me. Now, I'm afraid something else might get me first. Something worse. I just had to tell this story to someone. Living in off-campus housing wasn't my first choice, especially not in a house that made the trailer I'd grown up in look like the Four Seasons. Listen, a full ride to Trinity College was such a gift and I'm not complaining, but what they don't tell you is room and board is not covered in a full tuition scholarship and it's basically the price of another semester, plus Money wasn't especially tight after my mum, well, I guess that's besides the point right now. It was coming down to the wire when I found a Craigslist ad for a cheap room in a house that was split up into three apartment units. Apparently, that's the thing in New England, to take an old crumbling house that should otherwise be torn down and split it up by floor into apartments so you can continue charging college kids an arm and a leg. This house was probably paid off in 1850 and the descendants of the owner were just cashing the checks every month. Once I have a degree and start making real money, I'm investing in real estate. Roommate wanted, female only. We're looking for a roommate to two lovely Trinity sophomores. Cheap rent, no pets, reach out if interested, but no further questions. Lucky for them, I was so desperate to get away, I couldn't think of a question if I tried. I lugged my bag six blocks from the bus station to the front gate, where a very attractive, but again not the point guy, was sitting in a lawn chair outside drinking some beer. Behind him, my new home loomed, a colonial artifact cobbled together from red brick and wood. I could see a faded outline on the third floor from where a window must have been plastered over with new brick. It was silly seeing someone so boyish and carefree in stark contrast to the worried and weathered home behind it. He noticed me struggling with my luggage and sprang out of his chair to help. Hi, I'm Josh, are you moving in? He put down his beer and ran to meet me at the steel gate entrance. Uh yeah, I'm Colleen. I'm in apartment 3 with Abriana and Katrina. Josh unlocked the gate for me and grabbed my roller bag, walking me to a side entrance that opened into a long, narrow staircase that led up three floors. I noticed a plaque on the outside of the house saying it had been built in 1690. Wow, in New England, that's old. You're on the top floor, Josh said as he started lugging my bags up the stairs for me. I noticed that for a house with only three floors, there were five doors along the stairs. It's not incredibly woke, but this is an old house, and some of the doors along the staircase lead to pathways servants or whatever used to use. My door is the second one from the ground floor. I live there with Joey and Will. You should come by tonight and say hi. We usually just drink and play Mario Kart Friday nights. He was talking really fast, despite how winded the stairs and heavy lifting were making him, almost as if he was nervous to talk to me. I figured that was okay because I'm practically nervous all the time, and here I was, all the way from my small town in West Virginia for the first time ever. We reached the top of the stairs and before I could even knock, the door flung open. My roomie, Abriana, came out. Our new roommate is here, Josh yells. I'm Katrina, they them. My new roomie stood before me, beaming with excitement. Katrina looked like the type of person anyone would want to be friends with. Warm brown hair and a big toothy grin that brought you in like a warm hug. Which exactly what they did. They wrapped my arms around them and before I could even take my shoes off, she was hugging me. You must be tired, can I make you some tea or anything? Katrina released me from their embrace and ran to the stove before I could even answer. Well, before I could even answer, I saw a bedroom door open and another girl walk out. She had inky black hair and the bluest eyes I've ever seen. Hey, you must be Colleen. Welcome to your new house. Ebriana didn't embrace me like Katrina had, but her icy eyes had warmed up a little and she seemed genuinely happy I was there and intrigued 
of me being her new housemate. She proceeded to give me a quick tour of the apartment and I could hear the wood creak beneath my feet with every step I took. The sun also had almost completely gone down outside at that point and the wind started whipping hard against the thin glass windows. They almost looked like they were the original panes from the 1600s. My room was nothing special, but for 250 bucks a month I would have lived in a closet. There was a door next to mine in the hallway that had an intricate silver knob, but when I reached for it, Adriana stopped me. Oh, um, that's the door, it's been locked forever, don't worry about it. The owners are insistent we don't go in there. I could see the dirty imprints of fingers above the doorknob. That could have have been true. From the way the house was situated, I could tell that the boarded up window I had seen from the street was on the other side of this door. What were they trying to hide? Just then, fainter than the sound of my own heartbeat in my ears, I saw I heard a tap on the other side of the door. Tap, 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 and then nothing. I turned around, but Adriana was gone. Katrina gave me my keys, one for the gate, one for the mail, and one for the door that opened to the staircase and another for our front door. I had changed my mailing address to the house a few weeks ago, and I needed to run to the mailbox outside of the gate and see if any of my books had been delivered that I ordered. When I reached the gate, I noticed a ghostly girl, maybe a few years older than me, standing by the mailbox. She was looking up at the third floor. She had sunken eyes and her skin looked so paper thin. I thought that if I reached out to touch it, my fingers may break through to her blood vessels. When she noticed me, she flinched backwards as if my 5 foot 4 frame was somehow a threat. Did you just move into this house? She asks. Almost acoustery. Yeah, I'm a student at Trinity. Do you live in this neighborhood? My answer must have triggered something in her, because her eyes went wide. She walked up to me, getting in my face, and whispering so no one else could hear. Leave. Transfer. Whatever you do, pack up your bags tonight and get a hotel. Don't stay here. I tried to back away, but her hands went to my face, and her nails started digging into my jaw, holding me in place. I wanted to scream, but the pressure of her cold hands prevented my jaw from opening. Her dark eyes were bulging now, as if the fear in them was causing them to shoot out of her skull. Hey, get the hell away from her! Josh yells, running down the path towards the gate. As soon as the young woman saw him, she released her grip from my face. Don't listen to him or anyone, she said, while backing away. I know what you did to her, I know. She did this to my best friend. The strange woman took off down the street, sinking into the darkness between the streetlights and disappearing. Oh, that's just a crazy girl that went to Trinity last year. Her friend Megan lived in your room, but someone caught them spewing some nonsense or hate on Instagram Live, and they had to transfer out. Megan at least had the good sense to leave for good, but she just kind of hung around, Josh said. That's really screwed up, I said. My body was trembling as I looked at the space in the street she had slipped away in. That wasn't a really nice welcome to the neighbourhood. Can I make it up to you, Josh said. That night, the three of us went down to hang out with the guys. I loved that the group had been taking me in as their own, and just from drinking and laughing, I learned that Josh had a rough home life as well, and actually ran away when he was 16. I was starting to feel like we were kind of similar spirits, trying to forge a new beginning for ourselves. Will and Joey were great too. Will was playing DJ and kept asking for my requests, which I really appreciated. Joey was making cocktails, but I think, really, he was just putting orange juice in Natty Light. I'm not a big drinker, so things started getting lazy and hazy around 1am. The Christmas lights they had hung up in the common space for decoration were twinkling like stars in a distant galaxy. My cheeks were getting sore from smiling and laughing all night. I had now forgotten about this crazy girl that had grabbed me and given me the warning. I remember the feeling like I really, really wanted to go to bed and I was getting pretty cold in this house now. I sort of remember brushing my teeth, but I don't remember my head hitting the pillow. That's when it all got a bit weird. 
I awoke to a hot breath on my neck. Did one of those guys come back up with me? That was super unlikely. Listen, I'm not a prude, but I basically raised myself, and it takes more than just a few beers for me to let you get past my outer shell, okay? I rolled over to see what time it was, but for some reason, I couldn't feel my bedside table when I reached out. Actually, this didn't even feel like my bed. Suddenly it clicked. I shot up to look around, but I couldn't see anything really. It was so dark that it was like I was in outer space, but without any stars. Like pure darkness. I was locked in a room with no windows. Just when that thought crossed my mind, I heard breathing in the corner of the room. Hot, laboured, heavy breath, in and out, then a pause, in and out again, shaking like a death rattle. My head was still spinning from the beer, but I knew enough to jump up and feel around for something, anything that could help me get my bearings. That's when I noticed a keyhole, the only pinprick of light in the whole room. I took a step towards it, and I heard a step in the far corner mirror of mine. The floorboards moaned with the pressure of whoever else was in the room with me. I took another step and heard the floorboards in the corner creak again. Somebody seemed to be walking in time with me. Then, I bolted for the door, hoping to outrun whatever was behind me. I got to the knob and tried it, but it was locked. The steps in the corner continued towards me, still slow though and heavy. The floorboards creaking every couple of seconds. There was nothing more terrifying in my entire life than hearing those footsteps but not being able to see what it was walking towards me. Closer and closer as I pleaded with the doorknob to let me out. I clawed at the wooden door and then I felt the tips of my nail shred against the splintered wood. I could tell the wood was exposed almost as if someone else had been scratching there before. The breath was getting louder behind me, and just when I felt it on my neck, the door opened. I spilled out and slammed it behind me. The air outside the room was about 10 degrees warmer, and I sucked down fast breaths while I tried to stabilize my heart rate. Here's something I didn't tell y'all. I sleepwalk bad. One time, back in West Virginia, I woke up sitting in my neighbor's barbecue pit no recollection of how I got there. I'd been able to change clothes, open doors and eat entire containers of leftovers while in my sleep. It's something I've learned to live with. One thing I've never been able to do though is get through a locked door. Locked doors are the only thing that can keep me put when I'm sleepwalking. So, how had I gotten through this one? And what was on the other side? Well, that night it turns out I was sleepwalking, but while I was sleepwalking, I was having a nightmare that something was in the room with me. I don't know if this room is haunted or has some kind of a spirit that the girl before was trying to warn me about, but in my sleepwalking dream, I nearly made contact with it, and somehow I managed to find the key, use the logic, and think myself through while sleepwalking to unlock the door to get myself out. Almost like my subconscious woke me up to get me out of that door, even though I don't remember any of it. I'm currently looking for a car. Since I'm living on my own now, and I'm using public transportation to get everywhere. I'm looking for a new job though, and I don't want my options limited to wherever there is a bus stop. But because I'm a poor college student, most car dealerships are a bit over my budget, and when they do have cars that are in my price range, they tend to be really crappy. So I've resorted to trying out my luck on various sites like Craigslist, hoping to score a bargain deal. This happened a few nights ago, right when my school went on Thanksgiving break. My school have this whole week off at the exact same time that the new Pokemon games came out. Yeah, holla at your boy. Since I don't have to wake up early anymore, my whole sleeping schedule has flipped around, 
but me basically going to bed at around 4am. Because I'm on Thanksgiving break, I'm visiting home, but this particular night both my parents were gone due to their own little mini vacation. So I'm chilling in my parents basement at around 2am when I decide to check up on a local site like Craigslist and see if any car deals got posted since the last time I checked. Lo and behold, somebody had posted a killer deal on a fairly new, 2003 is new for me okay, car that was exactly in my price range. The description said that there were no mechanical issues, it had passed all safety inspections and the only reason they were selling it was because the seller's dad's car and he had recently passed away. Seeing as how I was bored and restless, I texted the number provided saying I was interested and prepared myself for another few episodes of Grey's Anatomy. I figured there'd be no way they'd get back to me that night because of how late it was, but I wanted to be the first offer they saw in the morning when they woke up and checked their phone. A few minutes later however, my phone buzzed. The guy said, hey, Thanks for the interest. I didn't expect so many people to answer an ad posted at midnight lol. I have someone coming to look at it around 7am, so you can swing by after if they don't get it. Unless you want to come over now that is. I'm pulling an all nighter so it doesn't matter to me what time you want to come look at it. At this point I had two options, do the sensible thing and wait until it was light outside or decide to go meet a complete stranger at 2am in the morning off of Craigslist. I could feel the smart angel and the dumb angel on opposite shoulders whispering in my ears, but the energy drinks I had just consumed helped the dumb angel win out. I replied, sure man, it's not often I go out and do crazy things this late at night, but that's what being a stupid college kid is all about lol. He texts me his location, but it's pretty far outside of town, so he agrees to meet me halfway. Luckily, or unluckily I guess, I had my dad's car I could use to get there since my parents had taken my mum's car. So I hopped in and drove to the address. I arrived at about 3am in the morning. The whole thing was exciting and I kind of revealed in the fact that I was doing something kind of stupid, but I figured that taking a risk for such a great deal was how you got the good deals anyway. The one thing that freaked me out was the place, it was super creepy. I parked in front of a parking garage and double checked the address. Yup, it landed me to a really seedy part of town that was deserted even during daylight hours. Before I could even text him, I got a text saying I see you. I looked around, a figure came out of the parking garage waving his hands. I got out of my car and took a look. The guy was tall, about 40 years old and balding. He had pale white skin and a really really strained smile. His whole face looked uncomfortable from how much he was grinning. Even in the dim light I could see how yellow his teeth were, and while the lower half of his face was smiling, his eyes weren't. They look dead. Hi, 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 good to see you. The car is parked in the garage, let me take you to it. He didn't even wait for me to introduce myself before physically grabbing my arm and attempting to steer me into the dark parking garage. I may be a bit of a dumbass sometimes, but at this point my alarm bells were going off, I can assure you that. I wrenched myself free and tried to initiate a big of small talk but he kept shuffling around until he was eventually behind me and kept shuffling towards me as I talked, trying to push me into the parking garage. At this point I knew something was way off. I tried to glimpse into the garage and I couldn't make out much, just a small red light a few feet off the ground. Focusing on the red light I made out something that made my entire body feel like it slumped to the ground in dread. It was a video camera. And now that my eyes were adjusting, I could make out a brief outline of someone standing right by the camera. Again, I'm a total idiot most of the time, but every so often, I'll have a bright idea accidentally. Thank god, this one was one of those times. Oh crap, hang on, I forgot my wallet in my car. I tore myself free from his grasp 
and started jogging towards my dad's vehicle, sounding like the chill cucumber that I totally am. Without giving him a second chance, I responded and looked back over my shoulder and said, Give me a second, it's in the passenger seat. He was staring at me, and for once his dead eyes showed emotion. Rage. It was one of the most terrifying things I'd ever seen, and I can't get it out of my head. His smile was so huge and so forced, but his eyes were incredibly, incredibly angry. He didn't say anything as I got to my car, unlocked it, and got into the driver's seat and acted like I was rooting around in the passenger seat for the wallet. I did hear something as I jammed my keys in the ignition and slammed my foot on the gas pedal. Hey! It was a really deep, really angry voice that was totally different from the guys I was talking to. I booked it out of there, but as I looked in my rearview mirror, I saw about 10 figures run out of the parking garage waving crossbows and bladed objects in the air. I was going about 80 miles per hour on State Street, but I didn't care. I drove that fast until I got home and parked, and I was shaking the whole way back. I ran into my home, locked all of my doors, and checked to see if anybody followed. They didn't. I phoned the police and they came over and took my statement. I'm not sure if they believed me at first, since I was already home by the time I called them. The Craigslist ad was cleverly pulled, and all I had were a series of text messages from what turned out to be a stolen phone. The parking garage was empty by the time they got there, and they didn't find much at all. Beside two rolls of duct tape knocked over in the corner. So, lesson learned. I told my parents about it, and even at the age of 19, I'm now no longer allowed to use their cars after 8pm. I don't know exactly what they were planning to do, but the weapons, duct tape, and video camera gave me a pretty good idea. I was new to a big city, and I decided I didn't need my car anymore. I listed it for sale, a six-year-old Honda Accord. A normal, well-dressed man comes over to see it after a few phone calls about the car. He's in his early 40s, and his name is James. He's buying it for his daughter in college, or so he said he was. I always have my guard up when dealing with strangers, but so far James is personable and seems legitimate. He test drives it with me sat in the passenger seat. He does a thorough inspection. He negotiates the price with me for a while. He eventually asks me to hold the car for two days so he can get the money and come and pick it up. I agreed. A two day hold where I won't sell it to anyone else. Two days later, James follows up and we meet again, midday this time. Normal neighborhood in an urban city and we were there with James deciding that he wanted to test drive the car one more time. He gives me a Chase Bank cashier's check, which I said was fine. I tell him he needs to come to the bank with me to cash his check and to get the title notarized over to him. This is when he starts acting a little nervous. We're pulling over to the side of my street discussing this, James in the driver's seat and me as the passenger. I figured if he was going to steal my car, he would have gone two days earlier. Now I'm fairly comfortable with him at this point. He asked me to do one more car inspection with him, then we'd go to the bank after. I agree, but I'm very set on doing the transaction at a bank. As we both get out to inspect the car again, he jumps back in and floors it as I try to get back in with him. He pulls away quicker than I can react. The passenger door is still wide open as he's speeding away down the road. I tried to run after him and then realized I'm not as fast as a car. There are bystanders and I hysterically ask someone to call 911 immediately. One guy does. I had my phone but my adrenaline was through the roof and I didn't even remember that it was on me. As I'm on a stranger's phone with dispatch, an undercover cop car with two officers pulls out of an alley five feet from me. I wave them down and hysterically explain my story as I panic. They tell me to hop in the back of their car, which I do. I implore them to hurry and we catch this guy. He just drove off. I explain the car and plate and everything. 
They assure me that they will not go on a high speed chase with me in the car, but will radio it in to all surrounding officers, which they ended up doing. The guy gets away and the officers drop me off at the police station to file a report. I file an insurance claim too, and I'm so mad at myself for letting this guy get away. I suppose it's better than if I was in the car with him however, but I'm still mad. Of course James, the burner's cell phone, wasn't working anymore and he had left completely. I go through insurance and their protocols to ensure I'm not committing fraud for about 3 months. The week I'm supposed to get paid, I get a call from police. They found the car, it was 3 states away. Turns out James was working with a partner in crime, don't remember his name, let's call him an idiot. James stole the car and gave it to this idiot to sell so he wasn't traceable, back to James. And the guy ended up being plausible and he was denying ever being a part of it. This guy sold my car to an average Joe who actually did have a daughter in college who needed the car. The daughter tried to register her car at the DMV and it came up as stolen. The cops arranged for me, the average Joe and the idiot that sold it to them to come together and meet at the station for a little chat. So, here I was face to face with the criminal that sold my car. He denied any involvement with James but agreed to give us the money back that average Joe paid him if we can just leave without any problems. We eventually all agreed to this. Average Joe and I say his daughter can keep the car and I'll take the money from the guy who sold it to them. So eventually I got paid for my car, but this experience sucked and was very stressful. Since then I have bought and sold all my cars on Craigslist again, so no lesson was learned I guess. I was moving out of an apartment that had a washer and dryer hooked up into one. We didn't need it anymore, so I sold my washer and dryer separately. I ended up having separate buyers. The guy who came to buy the dryer was great. He was getting it for his daughter who was going to college. I helped him load it into the back of the truck and he gave me the payment. I never heard from him again. The guy who bought the washer was a whole different story. So, I got a text from him asking if it was still available. He haggled the price, all normal stuff, we set a time and I waited for him to get there. Now I only had one week left in the apartment so I didn't care too much about random people coming to my home like I normally would. Pretty much all of my stuff was moved into my new place but the internet wasn't turned on yet so I was still just sleeping on an air mattress in the old one for the time being before I moved out eventually. He ended up being a few hours late and showed up in a truck that was used for transporting large glass panes. He had like 5 people with him all crammed onto the front bench seat of the truck. They loaded it onto the truck with it leaning at a 30 degree angle against the glass pane rack. He tried to haggle it down to an even lower price but I didn't budge this time. He left and I thought it was all over, finally I just got rid of two main compartments that needed to go ASAP before I could move out. Anyway, later that night I started getting texts from him about how it doesn't work and he wants his money back. I told him as it was written in the post that it was sold as is and was working when I sold it. I assume it was damaged the way he was rigging it onto the truck well after a day he starts calling me and cussing me out, sending death threats and I have other random numbers calling me doing it all at the same time. Over the course of a week my phone was blowing up with random texts and calls of people going nuts at me. Two nights after I sold it I also woke up at 3am with people banging on my door yelling. Luckily I lived on the second floor with no easy access to the windows. I sat there for about 15 minutes while they continued to yell through the door banging on the windows. The next day I moved the rest of my stuff into my new apartment and never went back there other than to turn the keys in. I still got calls and texts from him on random numbers for up to 2 months after that, over a $150 washer. 
I don't sell stuff on Craigslist anymore and I can assure you for certain it wasn't broken when I gave it to them. My youngest brother sent me a text one day. He'd saved up 700 bucks and wanted a new computer. I told him I know a subreddit we can go to, but no, he told me that he'd found a guy on Craigslist with a machine. He says it's like 1000 bucks machine and he was only selling it for $600. He wanted me to go with him to check it out. I couldn't know, my schedule was absolutely packed. The guy basically says he can do a Skype call showing the PC working and I can peek inside the guts from the video call, so I do that. It looks good, very high end computer and everything is brand new with boxes for the components. I tell my little bro, who was 18 at the time, that it's all good. He can go snatch it, go ahead. Well, about 8pm I get a Skype message from my Craigslist seller saying I've got your brother. I freeze, my blood runs cold and for a solid 20 seconds that felt like hours, I started running through how I was going to find this guy and get my brother back. Finally, he finishes typing his second message. This was the second message that he sent to me. Your brother wanted to meet in Walmart parking lot, so we met up and I got out to shake his hand and he just fainted all of a sudden. He's sitting in my SUV, he woke up once and just passed out right again. So, after reading his second message, I told my bro no because I had work, but obviously this needed to be handled, so I go out. I get out of my car and instantly see why my brother basically fainted. This dude steps around the SUV and is like 9 feet tall, probably exaggerating but it must have been at least 7 foot. He was so jacked and I think he would have beat up Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. I'm a little less paranoid than my brother, so I hold my hand out for a shake. We do so and he puts a giant hand on my shoulder and points inside the SUV. I can see my little brother sitting in the far back seat with his knees on his chest, like a puppy during a thunderstorm. I end up chatting with the guy, he literally just tried to meet my brother to sell the computer but he actually fainted in terror. He scooped him up and put him in the back seat to rest. This actually happened and there I was thinking he had abducted my brother and was holding him at ransom. So, eventually I open the door and put my head in. My little bro is basically on the verge of tears. I explain the situation to him. He admits that he thought the Craigslist seller was about to beat him up, steal his 800 bucks and maybe even take advantage of him. I laugh and then the seller laughs too. I chat with the guy for a bit as my brother is loading the stuff into his car. The guy said he thought the computer parts yearly when they went on sale and always sold them for a profit for himself, but a very low cost since he was slowly building them himself over the years in his room. He was actually a really great guy, he said my brother was the first person to ever pass out in fear because of his height. I mean, all's well that ends well and I'm sure it was more scary from my brother's perspective, but getting a message from a guy on Skype saying I have your brother is pretty damn scary to be honest. After my second year of college, I wanted to move into an apartment. I had basically no real friends to choose from, so I decided to try Craigslist. I made an ad for housing wanted, described myself, put a picture, and basically did that so I could draw more people in and give them an idea of what I looked like. I also put my number for texting. I stated I was more interested in rooming with girls as I was also a girl. This one guy messages me saying his name is Oliver and he has a nice apartment. The rent was really cheap, almost too cheap to believe, and he said that I could have the first month free. I considered it for a while because at the time I had no other good prospects. I talked to him a bit, added him on Facebook to chat over messenger so it was a bit faster. I regretted that pretty quick though because he started being super weird to me. He was a middle aged looking guy. He talked about how he worked at a tattoo shop and could get me a job there. At this point I obviously knew I wasn't going to move in with him, but for a bit it was making me laugh so I talked to him a bit longer. 
The conversation divulged into him essentially telling me he wanted me to be his girlfriend. I said no and then he told me he'd pay me $3,000 to fly out to California with him to meet his family so that they would think that he actually had a girlfriend. When I said no he kept begging me and telling me everyone thought he was a loser and all I'd have to do was hold his hand. I deleted and blocked him on Facebook then he began texting me asking me to send him a picture of myself. He said Please, I've never seen a 19 year old before. He continued badgering me, despite me only replying once to say no and that I had a boyfriend. He sent me a couple of unsolicited pictures of himself. Surprisingly, he apologized later that night and never did end up messaging me again. This is a message to all the girls or vulnerable people out there. Don't accept rent on Craigslist just because it's cheap and convenient. Those are often the ones that are too hard to believe or are too good to be true. Whatever's too good to be true or seems too much of a deal or a bargain is often not and comes with some hidden secrets that are pretty nasty. My son was an avid gamer. He used to play for hours on end and we used to have to limit his time playing on video games. He became so obsessive and although I have no clue about video games as a whole, as currently typing this I'm now in my 60s and back then I must have been in my mid 40s. He was a teenager like no other. He really did struggle with social settings and I guess it was just his thing to stay in the room and game. Although we did limit his time and tried to get him out as much as possible, he was often begging me to buy him the latest game or to get this virtual steering wheel. Yes, that's what I call it, but he had a name for it. So I found one on Craigslist and it was the exact one that he wanted. It was basically one of those wheels that you plug into the PC and it makes you feel like you're actually driving a car. It vibrates, makes noises, you can change gear. I think it even came with a clutch and some pedals and everything. At the time, I remember it must have been about 70 or 80 bucks. So as I went down and organized to meet this person, I was deciding that I was just going to go on my own because my son didn't want to come with me anyway. He struggled with things like this and talking to people was probably his biggest nightmare. The video games were probably mostly to blame because of that, however I liked seeing my son happy and I enjoyed buying him these things. He was no means a disrespectful or bad behaving child so I would definitely buy him things occasionally when he asked. So I set out a meet date and decided to go along. The person selling this steering wheel was actually looking for me to come to the house to pick it up. They said to me that they would plug it in and show me everything. Apparently they'd only used it twice but stopped gaming for whatever reason I can't remember. As I pull up to this house that they gave me the address to, I could hear yelling outside. I parked up my car on the side of the sidewalk, locked the door and began making my way up the steps to the front porch. As I knocked on their first door at the front porch, no one answered. I figured the whole family were having an argument inside of this house, as there I was stood in the freezing cold mid-November winter, and I was just waiting, car keys in one hand, and not really knowing what to do. I figured I should just walk in, I drove 40 minutes to this house and no one was answering the door. I didn't have any internet on my phone, and I didn't get the phone number of this person, because I figured we'd just set the time that we would meet. He seemed super chill and he literally just told me to turn up at his house. He gave me the details and that was it. But when I turned up I realized this guy and his family were too chill. Not only were they arguing but as I stepped foot and opened their porch door I then began knocking and ringing on their main door as I was now in their porch area at this point. I didn't know how they were going to react of me just walking into the porch. I guess it was no big deal. Most delivery drivers or postal workers did this anyway and I was there to pick up something and pay him for it. So, there I stood, knocking on their main door, ringing the doorbell and still nobody was answering. I must have been there a good four minutes and I'm not even exaggerating. At that point I didn't know what to do. I was seriously considering even opening the main door and calling out for him through his name or going round the back and knocking on their windows where I could still hear them yelling and screaming at each other. I couldn't remember exactly what it was they were arguing over, 
but it seemed like it was something stupid, like whoever ate something from the fridge that wasn't theirs. This was obviously a big family that lived together, of at least seven people if I remember rightly. Eventually, someone does open the door, and that someone just so happens to be probably about a seven-year-old child. This seven-year-old child is stood there in what looks like a nappy, I know, I was so confused. Not only was this child looking a bit too old to wear nappies, but on top of that, they had toys in their hands and were doing the job of adults by answering the door to complete strangers. In the background, I could still hear the arguing. I asked this seven-year-old, not realizing that he wouldn't understand what I was saying or be able to really say much. I asked where Steve was. Steve was the guy who I was buying this off of. He looked at me, grunted, and just turned around, leaving the door open. I don't know where that kid went, but he must have gone into one of the back rooms. Seemed like this was an everyday occurrence, and as if he was new or used to all this arguing. Eventually, about another minute or two passes, and I figure I should just walk in. This family is so dysfunctional that I guess they wouldn't even care about me entering the house, and technically I had just been let in, even if it was by their five or six year old. As I walk in, one of the older people of the family, who I'm guessing was the other guy's brother, must have been Steve's brother or at least his friend, comes into the hallway where I'm still just stood in the porch waiting to talk to someone. I say to him, do you know where Steve is? I'm here to buy a steering wheel off a of Craigslist for my son. He points to a bedroom and then immediately walks off. He doesn't even talk to me. This was more antisocial than my own son and I didn't think that could exist. As I walk into this room he pointed at, there was trash everywhere. Now you may think your son or daughter has a messy room, but you have not seen anything. It was one of those rooms that were so trashy, so full of absolute crap that you could barely walk. As I tried to push the door open, there was so much junk, pizza boxes, old clothes, video game cases and discs all over the floor, blocking me from opening the very door. I had to push it pretty hard, and as I opened it halfway, I knocked on this door. No one replied, but I knocked again. Eventually someone did reply and it was Steve. Steve must have been about 5 foot 8, long hair, looked very greasy as if he hadn't showered in a good 4 to 5 weeks, and on top of this he was extremely overweight. He was listening to something on his phone with his headphones in, it must have been full volume because this whole time he hadn't heard me ringing the doorbell, knocking on the door, or even knocking on his own bedroom door meters away from him. He was lying there on the bed and quickly scurried up to put a t-shirt on, took his headphones out and met me. He said sorry about the trash and then moved me over to one corner of the room showing me this wheel that I was planning to buy. So, initially I had judged this family completely. I was expecting not to pay for this wheel thinking it was going to be sold to me broken or it was going to come absolutely messed up. However, after a while, I realized that this kid knew his stuff. Although his room was a total wreck, a seven-year-old had just opened the door to the house and the family was still screaming and yelling 10 meters in a room next door, he had all the full boxes, all the casing, the instruction manual and the wheel in full working condition. It was clean and ready to go. He even booted up the computer, turned on the game and showed me how all the buttons and the software works. I was pretty impressed and there and then I was ready to pay him the full asking price. I gave it to him cash, he boxed it all up for me which was nice, even taped it already as if it was brand new. Well that was just a story that you should never judge a book by its cover, quite literally, and although I thought I was going into an awful decision to buy this from some absolute wackos, it turns out it was one of the best things I'd ever bought from Craigslist, in one of the best conditions too. I brought this back and my son was more than happy, and once again spent hours playing on this thing. Many years ago, a friend of mine who was giving me a lift from a meeting asked if we could make a detour one town over to check out some puppies. He had been dealing off and on with a breeder, and the breeder had called and said the puppies were ready to be given new owners. This was an ad on Craigslist by the way. This was before GPS was cheap, so we had to take out an old ADC map to try and find where this guy was in Minnesota. 
it turned out that he was on a very rural piece of property down a dirt road. We ended up at a house that looked like it was about to fall apart. One of the walls was heavily leaning outwards and there was hoarding and trash all over the place. The guy met us at the screen door that was being held on by two ropes and lifted upwards. We went down to the hallway that was clogged with boxes of trash and we came across one box with a heat lamp where there were a bunch of puppies laying inside. Now, I don't know much about Labrador Retriever puppies but these puppies looked awfully young and lethargic. They looked like the type of dogs who had just opened their eyes. I pointed this out, there was a woman there in the house who was just stood there screaming at me that I knew nothing about dogs. She had been raising lab pups all her life, she said, okay. This made me and my friend feel super uneasy as we weren't really made to feel like guests or even customers at that point. They were pretty stubborn and nasty. Even at every question we asked, they would snap. So my friend started asking about where the mother was of these puppies. We were told constantly that she was out and about, she'll be back soon. The while, this just felt completely wrong, especially because these people wanted to be paid cash and seemed to be nervous that me and my friend wanted to take the puppy to a vet to be checked out. Eventually, things got a little heated and both me and my friend decided to leave and think about it for a while. I suspected the puppies were stolen, but my friend thought that it was unlikely for whatever reason. After a day or so, my friend called me and said that he had second thoughts. He decided to contact a local vet. Sure enough, the puppies actually were stolen. There was a breeder who was about 20 miles away who reported that all of his puppies had been stolen from his garage a few days earlier. My friend ended up contacting the police, giving them the address that we went to and showing them the Craigslist ad where they were trying to sell these puppies illegally.